I call this meeting of the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry to order. Over the last several months, we have been laying the groundwork for a new farm bill. And as chairman of this committee, I have repeatedly said we must listen to our farmers and ranchers first and growers. And that is exactly what Senator Stabenow and I have been doing, and we will continue to do that. We are well into the process of collecting the advice and counsel of farmers and ranchers and growers, those for whom this farm bill uh, tolls and is meant to work. And we will continue to conduct a thorough review of the farm bill programs that provide certainty to those across the country who are facing very economic, very tough economic times. We're in a rough patch. In these tight budgetary circumstances, Unfortunately, we had no choice but to find ways to do more with less to make every dollar count when seeking to provide assistance to our producers. And throughout this process, there is one word that I am hearing in nearly every farm bill hearing, summit, meeting, round table, whatever we attend, uh, and that is trade. Trade, trade, trade. Well, first crop insurance, but then trade, trade, trade. Uh, I've worked on six farm bills. Don't know anybody else that has asked for that task, but this is number seven. I can tell you that each one is unique, but one thing has not changed. Whether you are an apple grower in Washington, a dairy farmer in Wisconsin, or a cattle rancher in Texas, you need a strong and reliable market to sell what you produce. That's absolutely essential. That is the benefit of farm bill trade programs. With an excellent return on investment, these public-private partnerships help the full range of our producers, from commodities to specialty crops. Programs like the Market Access Program, or MAP, allow producers to partner with the department to market and promote their products to all corners of the globe. For example, in 2015, the California Walnut Commission used MAP funds to support efforts in India to promote the health benefits of walnuts. In that year, shipments to India increased tenfold. Just think of that. Another farm bill export program, the Foreign Market Development Program, partners with the uh, Foreign Agriculture Service and U.S. agriculture cooperators to, do, to uh, promote our commodities overseas. Example, in Egypt, the U.S. Wheat Associates have utilized the Foreign Market Development Program to promote U.S. hard red spring wheat to be used as a pasta ingredient. As a result, an Egyptian food and beverage company imported 30,000 metric tons of hard red spring wheat in 2015 and 16. They need to do it again this year. There are countless examples demonstrating the benefit U.S. agriculture receives through partnerships with Farm Bill export programs and the variety of agriculture industries tapping into, those, into these programs has continued to grow. We're going to hear today from the beef and potato sectors, but there are many others such as cotton, dairy, poultry, rice, sunflowers, citrus, lumber, sorghum, dry beans, and corn, just to name a few. As I've said in past hearings, we have our work really cut out for us with this next reauthorization. We will need to find ways to do more with less to reduce the burdens of overregulation and ask the tough questions as we re-examine programs to determine their effectiveness and if they are serving their intended purpose. There are 39 programs from the 2014 Farm Bill that do not have a baseline after fiscal year 2018. The Foreign Market Development Program and the Technical Assistance for Specialty Crops Program fall under that category. More and more, we are facing barriers to trade from other countries. In addition to developing and growing new markets, these programs play an important role in helping U.S. producers compete on the proverbial level playing field. And in addition, some changes need to be made to ensure that our organic producers are competing on that level playing field 
and that our own regulation that our own regulations and processes are not holding people back. A recent Washington Post article highlighted the issue of fraudulent organic imports. But my constituents in Kansas brought this issue to my attention a year ago. We pushed the Department of Agriculture at that time to do something. And it is clear that if it takes this long to get action, something needs to change. As I continue to repeat, with this tight budgetary environment, we need to ensure that overregulation and antiquated government processes are not preventing businesses from succeeding. Farmers in rural America can choose organics, not necessarily because they believe there's anything wrong with conventional uh, production, but because they recognize organics as a value-added opportunity. They are responding to a market signal and increasing their margins. And boy, is that market signal working today. However, it seems that uncertainty and dysfunction have overtaken the National Organic Standards Board and the regulations associated with the National Organic Program. These problems create an unreliable regulatory environment and prevent farmers that choose organics from utilizing advancements in technology and operating their businesses in an efficient and effective manner. Simply put, this hurts our producers and our economies in rural America. So I look forward to hearing about these issues and learning from those that have first-hand experience in the success of Farm Bill trade programs and the challenges associated with outdated processes. With that, I recognize my pleasure and privilege to recognize the Center for Michigan, Senator Stabenow, 